are at episode two. Apparently we're still doing this. Yes. Also, hi, I'm Eric Dewhurst. I've been playing Dungeons & Dragons for about a year and a half, uh, but it's been a part of my life for much longer. I'm Robert Sherman, and I also play Dungeons & Dragons. <laughs> so. Uh, and that is the subject matter of this entire podcast, webcast, vlogcast. This episode's subject matter is dice, and we have a couple sets of dice here. Um, I, I want to ask the question, what would a game be without dice? Uh, specifically a, a role-playing game, because I mean, we've both played Dungeons & Dragons for a long time, and um, it's just kind of, it's, it's just natural. You, you, you roll the dice for everything, but without that, could you still have the game? I feel like it's more of a discussion at that point. Like, there's no risk, no reward, no... Uh, it's like a polite fiction of, we're going to tell a story. And not to say that the story's not important, but I like the idea of having a, a random element to it, of having, you know, not, not knowing how it's going to pan out. And then when it goes in your favor, you're like excited. And when it doesn't, you, you know, you start to feel that, that threat or danger if, if that thing's not going your way. Um, whatever that might mean, it might mean you fail a hit or you don't make a save or uh, a character that you've spent you know two hours working on to create and then in the past two years cultivating via games is just <laughs> gone right, right. like uh, I, don't, I don't see how you would not get that without having some you know random element to it and I feel like the right. maybe not the best random element to it but the one that I'm mo most attached to it would be rolling dice right the function of the dungeon master in a game without dice would be effectively uh, to be the arbiter of everything that the game players want to do. Um, and it, it's, I know some people who play diceless role-playing games. I've never played a ro diceless role-playing game, and I'm not sure that I would enjoy it because, like you said, it's, it's a discussion at that point. It's, there's, no, there's no risk. So then you don't feel the reward when you take the risk and you, and you try something it's at best you're negotiating your way through a, a set of circumstances but we play Dungeons and Dragons and I, I think you could argue that Dungeons and Dragons is a perfect pairing of that storytelling and the the risk involved in the mechanical elements of ro rolling the dice because it's such a successful game yeah. it's been around for what is it more than 45 years now and uh, it's gone through so many iterations, but the dice is, have always been there. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, I mean, I'm sure there are other uses for them. I don't know, there's probably some very obvious use that everybody knows about that I don't, and I'll, I'll look very foolish for, for uh, proclaiming my ignorance so proudly, but uh, I mean, if not, if not from Dungeons and Dragons, I would never see anything other than your standard D6. Yeah. I, just, I would have no experience with anything other than that, right? Um, and for Dungeons and Dragons, the different iterations, the different editions, you know, uh, for me specifically, I'm biased, fourth edition comes to mind. The shit that doesn't work gets recognized and tossed out pretty quickly, right? Hmm. If they didn't add something, if there wasn't just something about them, they would have gone away a long time ago. Like, that's mean, how I feel. You mean there could have been an alternative to random number generation? Well, if, or, if, or no, I mean, like, if you could just get away with, you know, instead of having a d20 to do 3d8, you, well, that's fair. These are everywhere. Yeah. You know, they, they're, they're very, they're just they're everywhere, right? Yeah. So you can, if you could get away with just doing that and it, the rest of them didn't add anything else to the game, that would have happened a long time ago. Probably. There's a reason why they've stuck around. There's a reason why they've endured. And there's a reason why people just can't get enough of them. <laughs> you know? Uh, this, this particular set of dice I purchased in England uh, in December for seven pounds British. Um, it's not that's not particularly expensive, um, and you but you have uh, so I, I we'll get into I guess we'll get into brands a little bit. These are Chessex, um, and Chessex is probably the biggest brand as far as uh, how many dice are produced and sold. Every game store you walk into, chances are they're going to have predominantly Chessex dice. Um, they also produce a lot of different um, looking ones. I'll, we'll put pictures of of this set up uh, over the video now and um, but you have you have a different set there 
Yeah, so what I have here uh, is a set of game science dice. So uh, I love these. Big fan. Eric, you've got a, a couple sets, I, I believe. I do have, uh, I think I just have one set, a red set. Um, and We'll put a picture of those. Up every, up. Everything, I love everything about these. Um, they they very, align very well with my obsessive compulsiveness. Um, <laughs> they are precise, I feel. Um, we'll probably get into that as well. We will, shortly. <laughs> very shortly. Um, but uh, a lot of this hobby is just blatantly kind of irrational as far as that. <laughs> you could go your whole life gaming with one set. Yep. You could. I uh, don't know why you want to live that way, but you could, right? <laughs> um, and, and so you just... Um, I, I love everything about this this specific set of, um, of dice, and I just I love, love them. I, and I always go back and forth between calling them dice die. I'm sure I'm doing it wrong. Uh, I don't care, but uh, <laughs> they they appeal to me on, on what, multiple levels. What how how do they appeal to you beyond just I mean, they look nice? They have very sharp edges mm -hmm. uh, versus the the Chessex dice, which have rounded edges, and we'll get into why that is. Is there, is there something else about them? Uh, well, they, they stop. So when I roll them, they'll stop. Right. If I use the control. I'm going to roll that. It's going to roll like mm -hmm. six inches further than the point where I drop it. So I'm going to roll this for a demonstration. I don't want to roll them too much because I listen to a podcast and you people roll the dice right next to the microphone. It's fucking obnoxious. But um, so this will be the one time I can, I I do I can it. mute it right, right when you hit them. Okay. But it just kind of stops once it, the, you know, it loses energy. It just, it just stops. And if, if I roll, if you roll this one in the, in the same way. Kind of pops around. Yeah. You know. Uh, but anybody who's played will know what we're talking about. Like, it, it can just roll and roll and roll. And there, it's off the table. And, you know. Yeah. Game science dice tend to just stop. They, they, they'll do their thing. And then they, in a very consistent manner, they just stop. Our friend Matt uh, actually had... He bought a, a bag of 100 dice. Yes. And he found one that was just the cheapest. Like, everything's so rounded that he rolls it, and it would just roll all the way off the table. Like a marble. Just <laughs> goes. I, the, one of the things I love about them is one of the things that I really don't necessarily like about them. I go back and forth, and it's just I'm undivided on it. But you have to color them yourselves. So <laughs> they come, you know, the, the numbers, they're, they blend in, you can't see them. You have to color them in yourself. So like the first set of Game Sands dice I did, I kind of went old school and I just took, I bought a set of crowns and I just sat there and I just scraped the crown on them until, you know, the the number and dents were filled in and then you could see that and then everyone would roll them around and that would wear off or it would chip out and you just couldn't see me more. I ended up doing a, like these gel paint pens. Hmm. That worked out really well, and I love the way the silver pops against the the black of the the dice, uh, the die, or I don't know what I call it. But uh, the way the end result I think looks great. Um, I like the way that they roll. I just I like knowing that I like knowing that I know the concept behind why it rolls differently than a tumble die. All that. Like, right. I, I, we actually looked into it. Yeah. So I think we should talk about that. I'll, I'll give a synopsis quickly. So the difference between this die and this die is relatively subtle. Material-wise, they're practically the same. The game science is actually a little bit lighter material, um, but they're both plastic. The mechanism by which all dice are created is that they are plastic poured into well, all modern dice anyway. All modern and mass-produced dice are plastic poured into a mold. The mold generally contains all of the dice uh, and all the dice are on a tree, just like um, old model kits. Yep. That means that there's a tiny little point that touches from the tree to each die in that mold. And that's true of Chessex and that's true of Game Science. Um, the difference between Chessex and Game Science is after that point. Uh, Chessex, they snip it off the tree and then they put it into a, a set of tumbling processes uh, with uh, grit, sand, that uh, smooths off the edges of the dice. Um, and ideally that process is 100% random or at least consistent enough that the corners are all shaved off in a very consistent manner. The fellow, I don't recall his name at the moment, who invented game science, and he still runs game science, he said, that's not good enough for me. That process is too random 
and can potentially introduce uh, inaccuracies into the dice because you're shaving off the edges in a, in a potentially inconsistent way. If a die gets caught in that tumbler in the wrong place, it could, it could be lopsided. Um, so he does not tumble his dice at all, but he still has that little tab onto the, the, uh, the mold tree that he has to cut off and file off a little bit. Um, that's, that is effectively the difference between these two dice. Um, so in theory, the game science dice has perfect corners because the, the molding process produces a, uh, as close to perfect as you can get with that material. But there's one horrible flaw in his design, which uh, we looked into even further. Yep. So uh, we'll also take a picture of this. Um, on the 7 of the Game Science D20, you can see that original point where it touched the tree. Um, you can see he's done his job to clip it off and shave it down and have it flush with the face of the seven. Um, and I'm sure, uh, I don't know which number it is that uh, Chessex has their, their tree point, but I'm sure there's an equivalent on the Chessex. So, okay. <laughs> so Eric got a little obsessed with this. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I give you mine, I knew that, I knew there was the, the, the blemish, if you will, um, where there's this little kind of nib of plastic that you can cut off or clip off or sand off or whatever but I knew it was there I wasn't I didn't think about it too much I honestly didn't think it made that much of a difference Eric was like uh, let's prove this I, I we yeah, can prove it I, it's, it's, it's an easy thing to prove uh, it's, it's <laughs> very simple I put a lot of dents in my kitchen table <laughs> or my dining room table yep. rolling game science and Chessex dice uh, before I found out that somebody else had already done this but as Eric <laughs> began to put some data together and I started to see it, I became obsessed as well. And so I was like, well, I started to roll mine. Uh, a lot of rolls happened. A lot of me sending him um, some data like, hey, can you put this into your, your spreadsheet uh, and see what, what happens? And um, then thinking, oh, what's a better way to get rid of that blemish? Do you, do you, do you clip it? Do you sand it? Just leave it there, right? Um, I don't know. but. Uh, ultimately, what uh, determined, somebody else had already determined, Eric, do you want to explain the, the, the blemish in the seven? Uh, well, yeah, I can, I can explain what the, the results of that blemish are. After about three to six hundred rolls, so rolling the dice and just put, typing the number in and creating a graph, I'll, I'll probably put a link in the, uh, the description uh, to the Google Docs, as well as the, the people who went a little more obsessive than we did, they did similar tests, chesses. Chessex versus uh, Game Science, and they, I think, did 10,000 rolls per die. Uh, I don't think there was any statistical difference between 10,000 and, like, 1,000. Um, at least their results were identical to mine, which is that that blemish actually causes the die to avoid the, the number on the opposite of the 7. So it hits the 7, and there's just enough... Uh, of a blemish there that it either continues rolling over to one of the adjacent numbers or it continues rolling even further. Mm. Um, so 14 is lower, um, which that was really the only um, definitive piece of information that I got out of that test. There, there are some other um, potential things that were caused by that, uh, other numbers that seem to be a little bit higher but I'm not sure if, if that was statistically significant or not. Either way, point being, if it's avoiding 14 and it's going for other numbers, the average roll was below the average of a 1 to 20 die. So you're actually rolling, on average, a lower number on a, on a game science dice than a Chessex. And I, I say I, I also rolled the Chessex. It's flawed. <laughs> it was more randomly flawed. Yes, so if you remember, uh, and I have like three or four Chessex dice, and right. I rolled at least three of them, and they all had slightly different profiles. Eric rolled his uh, game science at 20. I rolled two of mine. Two game signs? Yeah, two oh, game signs okay. at 20s. The red and the black. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it was, 
Was it your red? Was your I red? have a clear red. Yours is clear. Okay. You have solid red. Yeah. Um, and the profiles for our game Science the Twenties, you could almost overlay them, and they're almost exactly the same. Yeah. And these are hundreds of rolls. Yeah. For each die. So yep. together, we're gonna be at least coming up to if not over a thousand rolls, right? Oh, easy. And they're just like photocopies of each other, right? They're they're, they're almost exactly the same. Um, but the Chessex ones were not consistent, but they were inconsistent in different ways for every D20. Yep. So um, I have uh, I have one set that is my favorite set because when I did the rolls on it, it was the most consistent, the most uh, even die of all the dice I own. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'll, you'll notice I used die for singular, dice for plural. Yep. That's, I'm working on it. Okay. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm flawed on all that. I understand. <laughs> I accept my my limitations. Um, uh, that being said, if you like a if you like a die, you like a die. the 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 amount of variance was enough that it's material after a couple hundred di hundred rolls. But how many rolls do you do in uh, even a campaign? One campaign, heavy die rolling, you might do two hundred rolls. So you're going to be in the 100 to 200 well, roll range. if you're a player, if you're in the game. Et That's true. Um, but there was one thing, a pattern that emerged that can only be described as spooky. Um, I observed it. You observed it. We observed it separately and we came back like, yeah, I saw it too. And that is, uh, at least for, for the game size dice, you have to roll it like a couple hundred times at the bare minimum because it evens out, but the number of times you will roll the same number, two, three, maybe even four times in a row, if you roll enough, uh, is is just fantastic. Um, yeah, it didn't make any sense. No, like, no, I, don't, yeah. I have no idea if it if it's a an artifact of how we were rolling. I mean, because I would roll the die, roll, pick it up, roll, pick it up, roll, pick it up, yep. and if there was something about the the way that my hand grasped the dice that was too consistent and the way that I rolled it that was too consistent but once you get into a pattern then you started seeing these multiples of the same number It'd be one 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 like what the, that doesn't ever happen in real gameplay yeah <laughs> and then when you look at it and you look at the data the runs you would get if I rolled it 200 times I would get three or four uh, runs of a number and it wouldn't be the same number every time no, no. It, it would float across the range of that yeah um it was just weird and eric saw the exact same thing and i and it, and it was never like oh it's two and then it's two again later you know it was no it would, it was it would like be wildly different a bunch of sevens a bunch of fours a bunch of 18s or like, what there would be you know if you had like a heat map of of rolls like i would I remember when I first started doing it, I got like five ones before I ever got a 20. It's like, oh, this doesn't bode well. I might have to get rid of this one, right? But then you look at your numbers when you're done, and there's it's within like one or two, the same number of ones that there were 20s. Like, it was right. very, very consistent. But it would just get these runs of favoring a number. Uh, it was just, I would never have expected that we would see that. And we no. both saw it. One of the other kind of major topics of dice is the suspicions of dice or the su the superstitions yeah yeah you i suspect them sometimes too but... <laughs> i'm not particularly superstitious just in general but i too have fallen into the this dice just rolled one three times in a row i don't want to use it anymore that mm -hmm. the, you said it just a second ago when you when you roll that die and you get bad numbers you're like i don't i don't know about this well, like, it goes back to there's some you know, irrational behavior. Of, like, I know that you're an inanimate object. I know that you aren't trying to, you're not out to get me, uh, but I'm still angry with you. <laughs> right. You're going to go I, over here for a timeout, right? I think a lot of superstitions come from needing to explain a process that is opaque to you. If, if this die starts rolling below 10, it, at least in my mind, I start telling the story that there's something wrong with this die. Maybe, maybe it's uh, the die itself, and I just never noticed it before, that this die just rolls low, uh, and maybe there's actually a flaw in it, 
or if I'm uh, more mystically superstitious, uh, it's just a bad day for me. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, whatever deity I believe in is, is not okay with me today. <laughs> but when is like, you know, the, the, the math come out when your head, when you're like, oh, no, no, that means I'm due. Like I've rolled R low. Right. For the simple, I, I, if I put it away now, I, I'm putting it away right before it's like four twenties in a row. Right? <laughs> so I, I gotta stick it out. Wait, I mean, that's the uh, that's the, the the gambler's fallacy, <laughs> is that well, you know, I've been watching that slot machine. It's yep. due to go off, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get a big winning. I just I'm gonna walk up to it. I'm gonna get the get the big money. My dad actually believed that. Yeah. Uh, he worked and lived in um, Nevada for a while, so. And he actually ended up bringing a decent amount of money home a couple times. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> looking at the numbers that we put together, if we roll that 20 times and it's all below 10, we know, according to that data, it's yeah, going to have a one uh, over 10. Right? Yeah, I, but so that, that gets into the, the nature of random number generation. A random number generator, every single time it rolls, it is going to be, you cannot predict it. Nothing about its past predicts its future. We use dice, which we have proven are flawed, to play these games. Why aren't we using computers? A topic that will come up in this, in our discussions, and a topic that comes up when I'm thinking about uh, just gaming in general is engagement. Mm -hmm. You need to engage the players and the DM. Everybody wants to be, uh, wants to be entertained by their gaming experience. And entertainment is all about, are you, are you interested? Are you excited? And rolling a die, having physical contact with what changes your fate in this game is far more interesting than pushing a button. I absolutely agree. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Uh, and, and part of it even almost helps you buy into that world insofar as, you know, if you're playing Dungeons and & Dragons and you're, you're imagining running around with, you know, armor and, and, and swords and you're fighting, you know, goblins, uh, every single time you, you use a piece of technology, a little bit, you, you get pulled out. Yeah. Right? Like, it's just, it just, it, it compromises that experience a little bit. You may not be aware of it, but on, on, on yeah. some level it does, right? I, I run, when I'm DMing, I use an iPad uh, to keep track of monster stats and whatnot. And every once in a while, I'm like, you know what? I, I just wish it was a piece of paper. It's just, mm -hmm. I know it will be a little bit more effort for me to get it on paper mm -hmm. first. And, and papers sometimes can have the same effect of taking you out of that experience. If you have to stop for two minutes and dig through a stack of papers for what you're looking true. for, as opposed to having some up there, it's just right there, you know, it's it's a fine line. Yeah. Um, and it's important to know what what helps and what detracts from that experience. That, um, Matt, Matthew Coville, who has his own web series, I'll probably put a link to it if I haven't already, um, he uses the term verisimilitude, which is a really big word for have you kept the people, the players or the reader, if you're writing a book or the viewer, if you're doing a movie, have you kept them suspending their disbelief and believing in the world that you've created? That's the line that you cross when you're like, I'm going to press a button. I think it's, it works. I mean, our, our friend Matt, he's used his iPad mm -hmm. as his die. Uh, friend Chris Rutledge, uh, who will probably be in the next episode. Um, he periodically just brings his laptop, has his game, uh, his character sheet up there. Some people are okay with it. I, I think you and I are kind of in line with the more physically tangible the game is, the more uh, the more disconnected from this reality and connected with that reality yes. I am. Which is completely counter to me normally in that I love shiny gadgets. I, I don't want right. as much on them as possible and as little other stuff as possible if I could have all my books on uh, on, a, on a, you know, a tablet instead of just having a bunch of books I think that'd be great but when it comes to reading books for you know for for pleasure or you know instead of like work or something like that I like having an actual book oh okay um, and especially for gaming you know there's something about that experience of flipping through uh, and seeing the maps and all that and I can do that you know on, on an iPad and I, I do I have um, a, a, a large collection of, um, of, of PDFs. I'm firmly in the belief that, you know, things like Drive Through RPG and one of the best things to happen for modern gaming ever. Um, I'm a big fan of being able to look for something in, in a PDF and a well done PDF, being able to just search through it, you know, with 
um, all the text in the PDF because uh, it's very easy to make a really shitty PDF. <laughs> um, as great as that is, and being able to have an entire library of, of that kind of, uh, uh, of stuff with me, it does not replace having that module in my hands, having that rule book and opening it up, hearing the spine crack a little bit, <laughs> and then getting hit with that musty book smell. You know, it's just it's that's the best for me every time. Um, if you gave me, you know, like uh, a book for programming, like an O'Reilly's book, my my favorite definitely would be that. But I would still take a PDF of that any day, right? I just I don't need that physical experience when it comes to work or mm. a, a much more a- academic, you know, endeavor. But when it comes to gaming, I'm trying to every little physical piece helps me get into that mindset of you know not you know, current. Yeah. Technology. Uh, so, I mean, dice have been the the gateway to this <clears throat> discussion of engagement, but um, uh, but I don't know where I'm going from there with that sentence. <laughs> I think there's also there's something to be said for work versus recreation, right? There, an experience to be appreciated can't be too efficient. When That's I'm fair. at work and I want to get something done, and, and it's not, so, and if I'm working and it's not something I enjoy, and t- times I'm working and it's something I enjoy, I want to, I want to end that experience. I want to get it done as soon as possible. I That's want true. it over with. I want to move on to something else. Right? It could be because I want to get as much work done as possible. It could be just because I just don't care for what I'm doing and want to be done with it. But I want to be as efficient as possible to put in as little effort as possible to get the maximum return. You know, that efficiency is key to that. Um, you know, I don't want to be as efficient as possible as, as sitting on the beach, drinking a beer, and watching the sunset. Right? <laughs> Probably not. You want to stop and enjoy that. That I moment, hope so. You know. Yeah. Um, maybe you do. I, I don't know. That might be a, a larger underlying <laughs> problem. If that's the case. But like, it's just for something you enjoy, you want to stop and enjoy it, right? You don't. You don't want to get it over with as soon as possible. You know, for D and D, if you want, they're like, okay, look, we can bang this out in twenty minutes. Let's do it. Like, right. okay, you might be playing D and D wrong, um, <laughs> but you know, when we play, we go there like, okay, uh, we've got five hours, six hours, or, I, or as long as I can stay awake, and yeah, we go. I, I forget about time. Time yeah. disappears when we play D and D. It's uh, usually between the the uh, the time we sit down and the time we stand up. It feels like 30 minutes, an hour, and I'll look at my watch and I'm like, oh shit, that was, that was five, six hours. Mm-hmm. What the hell? <laughs> and you'll find yourself playing, you know, as a player or, or as a DM, and it's just like, you'll be dragging out these little pieces because the party doesn't really want it to end just yet, you know? <laughs> um, and it'd be like, and, you, and I'm sure people have experienced this, I know I've experienced it, where you, you're playing and then the end's like, right, well, that's our starting point. And it's like, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> the last game we played, I ran out of content, and uh, Eric, another Eric, uh, in our gaming group, he was he was uh, he was obviously not ready to be done. And I was like, I don't really have anything for you guys. I don't know that I said that out loud, but it was probably obvious to anybody who was who was paying attention. You guys had gotten to a city, and it was like, you guys can rest or do whatever you want. And he's like, I want to go to the magic shop. T- and I want right. to talk to this guy, and I want to start building trade relations with him and whoever he trades with. And I'm like, uh, okay. I mean, I got nothing to do other than play D and D right now, so let's let's talk about trade agreements. It was, it was fun. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, like that that was really enjoyable because we were all sitting there, and I remember I remember the session talking about, it, and we we're like, well, I don't want to go home. I'm gonna go home. <laughs> I don't want to go home. I can I can stick around for an hour or two, you know. And well, and the, well, of course, the funny thing is, your character had died. Yeah. In, in that session. So you were just literally sitting around I was doing sitting, nothing. I was, I was like, yeah, let's see where this goes. <laughs> uh, and I think you did. You hadn't didn't have another character rolled up yet. Either. No, I so, hadn't thought things through. I had a name. That was it. That was I it. pulled a name from you, my old we, characters, and that was it. We could have we could have played off of that if the party. Yeah, and I was I was a little panicked <laughs> uh, because I had a name, and I don't uh, think you had a class even. But well, maybe you did. Things had. Per, had unfolded in a way where it was like it, the impression was Robert's got this character and then our next step is to go and and engage character. this character and that's where that you know that's how things are going to unfold and I was like no I just 
needed a name, so I came up with a name. <laughs> uh, let's not pursue this just yet. I don't have anything to, you know, follow through on. Um, but again, as an example of things just kind of taking off life of their own. And was like, oh, yeah, great. Well, where is that person? Let's go there, <laughs> you know? Um, and just that enthusiasm is, is a fantastic thing. Um, but I'm, I'm going to bring it back to dice and talk about styles of rolling. As a dungeon master, more often than not, you're rolling behind a screen mm -hmm. so that if you want to, you can say, I rolled an 18. Uh, you know what? I don't want that monster to hit that person and kill that person right now because that would ruin the story. They rolled a 2. Sorry, they missed. And th that's something that happens potentially frequently, depending on the DM. I have done that. I've, I've rolled uh, dice and looked at the number and said a different number. Yep. I'm lying as the DM <laughs> about what I rolled in order to help facilitate fun, to keep it engaging. If I uh, accidentally kill a character when it just wouldn't feel right, um, I'm going to ignore the dice. Um, but the last, the last game we played, I took the screen away. I was like, you know what? I don't care. Uh, I don't think you guys are going to be in too dire of a situation. I feel like it's, I'm just going to roll all my dice out in the open. Everybody can see it. Um, and everybody can see everything. And then we all almost died. Well, yeah. But that was the nature of the, <laughs> that particular encounter. <laughs> Um, no, I think there's a lot of value to that, um, and there's a lot of value to mixing it up too. But it's that's not the only value for it. Um, there's that that mystery, that suspense, that that unknown of uh, it, if I tell you to roll a stealth check and you roll it and you roll an eighteen, you're gonna have this swagger of you you can't hear me, right? I'm just do whatever I want. And, and then my monster rolls a perception check behind the screen. But if I like gotta say if I roll your stealth check for you behind the screen and mm -hmm. I look at you and I'm like, Yeah, you know, you're good. Yeah, you rolled a you stealth check. You don't know. You have no <laughs> idea, right? Um, and that's a much for me, that's a much more enjoyable experience. Like, <laughs> I think I'm being quiet. Right. You know, um, and, and it removes that layer of metagaming that can happen, even if you don't want it to. If you roll in a 20, you know you rolled a 20. Right. Right? If I roll for you and I give you this fucking shit-eating grin, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you're good, don't worry about it. You know, you don't know if I'm messing with you. You don't know if it's good, you know. Um, but you have that suspense and, and that anticipation of what's going to happen. Um, and that confidence gets taken away, and there are circumstances where it's you sh it's inappropriate for you to for you and your character to feel confident, you know. Right, and I, I think that that's probably the best example of that in the whole game of D and D is the the stealth check, where you, as a player, you don't know what the other person knows, and by rolling your stealth and saying I rolled a twenty, I am being as stealthy as possible. That's too self-aware of the character, and mm -hmm. not just self-aware, but aware of, of his surroundings and, and the other creature involved mm -hmm. in the stealth check. I think I've, I've heard some people say they roll both the stealth and the perception uh, for the monster, the, that the DM will roll both behind the screen every time because it just doesn't make sense for you to know how stealthy you're being. Right. Uh, and the great example is, is knowledge, right? You don't know what you don't know. That's true. Or, or perception, you know, like uh, what, for me, I think a, a, a prime example is uh, is somebody lying or not, right? Um, mm -hmm. But you, you also don't know, like, are you a good judge of character or are you not? I want to know what the motive of this shopkeeper is. I'm going to roll a die to find out what the motive of this shopkeeper is. If you roll a high number, and the DM says, uh, "Oh yeah, no, they're they're perfectly." Um, on the up and up, and you don't you don't sense anything mm -hmm. weird going on here. Um, as a gamer, you're like, oh, okay, and you move on because you know you got a high number, and uh, you move on. And I maybe that's a broken part of of D and D that 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 check. If I fail it, I roll a one, and the DM says, yeah, they seem like they're on the up and up. You question it, right? And then the next player is like, oh, I'm going to sense motive too. And they roll 
and they get a 20, and the DM's like, well, you know, he seems like he's kind of trying to pull something over on you. That, it kind of forces metagaming into the game. And the, the, I mean, the very poorly kept secret that that really goes towards that suspension of disbelief is that a lot of NPCs are not a whole lot more than a name, maybe two stats, if that, and a plot point, right? Yeah. Uh, they're there to facilitate something for you to, to buy some gear or to give you a clue or that, right? And so if you roll some, within rolling two, you know, die, you know, okay, they don't know anything. Well, you have then very, you know, kind of neatly tucked them away into it, an NPC that isn't really all that important. Right. right. As opposed to they could have an entire backstory, all That's that. True. Example being another another podcast I was listening to, I think it was in kind of role play. The uh, the DM went into the story of how they had like somebody in Tavern like there was a somebody was serving them alcohol, right? Okay. Just a throwaway NPC. And just through the way things had evolved, like within, you know, a few sessions, this was a major player. Um, like a player, you know, a major player as far as the way things worked out. In the political structure of the game. Exactly. Um, just because of the way the role playing had unfolded and all that, you, I think you want to avoid a situation where somebody can just immediately be identified and relegated as not important. Right. Because uh, uh, the second you do that and you start to inventory things like that, you, you start to just lose that engagement. For me as a DM, I want to exude, I want the world that I am. Uh, helping the players create to exude depth. Yes. It should feel like every character that they run into has a, has, has, a, has their entire life, and it's uh, as important as any other. The more transparent I make the, the, my writing process, the worse, the more you realize that that barkeep, I have not written any lines for her. She didn't exist until you guys needed a barkeep and she's going to disappear until you need her again. Like, that's that's usually how it actually works. Uh, and then periodically, you know, you, you write a really in-depth character that... Uh, and and that, that shouldn't be obvious to the players. It shouldn't be obvious that this random stranger at the bar is the most in-depth character and the barkeep is the most... Uh, shallow character mm -hmm. and and like you said if if I roll perception or uh, insight or whatever uh, particular role against any of those characters just by rolling that dice I don't want to be told this is the flat character that's the yes that's the um, the character with depth at least for a, a DM you need to keep in mind the fact that when you present an, an NPC to your okay. players they're going to come to that encounter, that interaction, with a, a very fertile imagination of like, this person, what are they doing? And you'll know from the, the questions that they ask. Like, what's the first, <laughs> the first question they're gonna ask you is, what's their name? And you're like, no, it's not. Oh, shit, they don't have, like, you know, like. I, I, have, I have played, uh, I have run, I think about 16 to 20 games now in the last year and a half. And the number of times that players have asked the name of the NPC is like once or twice. Well, that's just very rude. But like, <laughs> I mean, if you listen to the actual play podcast, there's always, what's the name? And it's like, uh, and you can hear the pause of like, uh, a, a lot of, of people will tell you, you know, just keep a, a, just a random list of names that you can yeah. pull from. You like, know, the first all. time it happened, I didn't have a name. Yeah. The first time you guys are like, so what's the name of this noble? I was like, Shit, I just made this guy up. Like, he did not exist right. until you walked up to his house. <laughs> They're going to come into that ready to believe all kinds of things, already creating stories in their own heads about what this person's doing and all that. You have to show them that they're two-dimensional for them to get that, right? That's and true. so they're not going to get there by themselves. You'll be the one who peels away those layers of yeah. ability from that character, right? It's, so you have to cautiously not do that. I'm going to get a little nerdy in a slightly different way for a second. Um, so I, I, I have friends who are wine connoisseurs, and they talk about the best thing that a winemaker can do is to not mess it up. The best wine is a pure interpretation of what that grape was 
and how it fermented into the wine. And the winemaker can mess it up by any number of things, either fermenting too long or adding agents in the wrong timing or allowing contaminants in and all these sorts of things. And as a DM, that story, because it's being told by all of us, is only as good as the DM being able to allow it to grow. If the DM is like, well, crap, I don't know, everything falls apart right away. When Brittany walked up to that nobleman's house, knocked on the door and is like, can I speak to the Lord? And he walked inside and you asked, what's his name? And I'm like, I don't know. The whole game's over at that point. You don't care about it anymore because it doesn't exist anymore. If I'm letting characters, uh, letting players roll for insight and they know that this guy is flat, then it's not quite to the extreme of, I, for, I don't know their name, they don't exist, but it's, uh, it's on the same, same realm of kind of ruining the game for people. Maybe I'm being extreme. <laughs> no, it just, it just, it takes you out of that moment. Yeah. Right? It exposes it for what it really is, which is a, 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 um, a plot device to facilitate what the path that you're trying to, to go down, right? Uh, whereas for the players, it's a, a noble's manor with, you know, somebody in from the door and all that. And they're visualizing all of these things, the, the hill that it's on top of. And the second you say, oh, no, this is a mechanic for me to get to you from where you are to where I want you to be, they lose all that. <laughs> yeah. And then they're just like, okay, well, well what's the purpose of, of us being here, right? What are we trying to achieve mechanically to get this done to go on to the next thing? Right. Um, which, I mean, you, you just don't want to do that. So the... the the purpose of the dice, and I'm going to pull it back to dice, the purpose of the dice is to add that random element, the risk. So um, when, let's say you're in that conversation with a shopkeep, and you know that, that something's happening behind the screen, the DM's rolling, there's risk in you knowing information or not knowing information. Mm -hmm. That engages the player, I think, more than anything. If I was just having a conversation with the DM and I'm like, hey, what does the shopkeep know? And the DM says, uh, nothing. Then the shopkeep is useless. Right. Um, but if I say, what does the shopkeep know? And he's like, I'll roll an insight check for you. Apparently he doesn't know anything. <laughs> like, you don't know. Yeah. Uh, it adds that, that risk, that the potential that that world is bigger than you, than the DM could possibly create by themselves. The players are doing more than half the work in their own heads. And they and they can help you build that story in that it's, I don't think you and I have, you and I have talked about this, and I think it's a very, uh, it's a common uh, topic when you talk about running the game and all that, of trying to tell your own story and force your players into right. it as opposed to letting them tell their own story. I think we talked about this just recently. And... In introducing that randomness of you know rolling dice and all that, it encourages this improvisation that can get you more creative than you were when you started thinking about the story or what you wanted. Yeah, um, a random encounter can turn into something that is more memorable than the entire <laughs> planned session was, right? Like yeah, um, and you hadn't planned for that, but in that moment, and you've got five or six people looking at you, and then you have to come up with this, and then all of a sudden, you're like, well, I could do this too, or I could do that. I could pop that in there or what am I going to do with this this is going to be in the way or I can spin it this way so it adds to the experience uh, and none of that you had thought of when you walked the table that day right Right. Um, but, but, the, use, but if you play it right as a DM the players don't know that it was random and that's great too because they're looking at like man you're so, so creative like how would you <laughs> yeah. that and you're still like I don't know anything I'm not going to tell you that so I'm trying to think how do, how do we how do we how do we sum up what we've talked about Dice good. Dice good. Dice good. Dice good because they bring risk. They bring engagement. There's, there is an intangible about them, which is odd because in the game of imagination, they're one of the few tangibles. Let's say you have five people who've, who've never played together, but they've, they've been gaming for 20 years, and there's one person who's never gamed before, and they come up to that table and like, oh, hey, that's, that's nice, and they grab somebody else's die, and then all five people who just, just met each other are like, Oh, <laughs> shit, right? Like, Don't touch my dice. Right, you know? And then that one person's like, what did I do? 
<laughs> but everybody else just kind of knows. Like, well, they, don't, don't be touching their die. They don't, you don't know them. What's going on? <laughs> Got some nerve on you, pal. It's you like know? walking up to somebody's computer and being like, hey, well, let's, right. let's see your browser well, history. That's a computer, not a piece of plastic. But, you know, for a gamer, it's oh, the same damn thing, right? Right. Like, well, great. Well, now I have to get another pair. This one's ruined. <laughs> Can't use it for the rest of the night, you know? Why? Because you touched it. Um, and everybody else will understand it and they'll look at you like you're crazy because you're acting crazy. I'm really hoping that I haven't actually done that. I'm sure I, I've I, done I may it. have. Um, or, or, you know, as soon as later, you're going to have somebody at your table, they're, they're going to stack. They're all the oh, yeah. into a tower. Everybody always stacks their dice. Um, and you, you could probably go across the world, you know, somewhere else. And they're, there's just like this weird common behavior that people who don't know each other. And they'll do it, and it's surrounded around these weird shapes, right? Um, like that. stuff like some people will, whenever they're not using them, each die has to have their, you know, maximum number pointed out. I've been doing that this entire time. I've been yeah. flipping up, flipping my d20 to 20. I like to think it's for the ease of identification. It's a practical purpose. That's my 20. That's my 12. <laughs> that's my 10. The truth is they need to get used to be and accustomed to... Being that way, I'm training them so that they roll the way I want it's, them to roll. Uh, the the gravity of the Earth is pulling more of the molecules right. down to the to the side that is opposite of twenty, so that twenty will invariably yeah. show up more often. And either one, is, uh, I think that those are both crazy theories that are <laughs> true. But but that's that, what goes through my head but, when I'm flipping yeah, them up. But, 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 but it couldn't hurt, right? Like yeah. So, um, but you'll see other people do that as well. You know, it's, and it's yeah. not like, we don't get a newsletter, right? No. I, you know, I feel like we could probably talk about dice for another uh, 45 minutes. Most probably, yes. <laughs> but uh, I'm hungry. I need a nap. Yeah. So. So that's it. Um, oh, I should say, there was, uh, there was one uh, suggestion that I made that I didn't say out loud last time, which is uh, Dungeons and Tangents. Oh, Yes. Which I think is is a strong front runner. It's descriptive. I feel like it's accurate. Uh, because while we started on dice, we ended up on engagement. Mm -hmm. And last time we went all over the place too. <laughs> <laughs> Just in, in case it's not apparent, this is not scripted. There's like right. <laughs> maybe two or three bullet points. Of, uh, uh, there, there are there are five bullet points. Do that we hit I them all? Have. Say what? Do we hit them all? Uh, uh, diceless hand. games. The purpose of of dice. The accuracy of dice, the superstition of dice, and whether to roll open or hidden. We did, in fact, hit all of my the the different methods uh, of of dice. So two things that we didn't hit on. Can, oh. we, can we take the ten minutes? And, yeah, yeah, um, we got time. The different methods: uh, dice towers, dice towers, dice bowls, cups, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. So trays so it doesn't keep rolling. Yeah, I like I've, I like those. I've never used a tower before. I don't like towers. Um, I think weird. I've used a tray a couple of times. It feels weird to me. But what I do like is I like the aesthetic of rolling on that felt that they put yes. in the trays. So if I can just get a table covering that, that'd be great. Uh, I always feel weird about rolling like on this kind of a surface. Yeah. Or it, like especially like a like your table. I'm yeah. afraid I'm gonna like just I always ruin put the a, table. The 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 game mat down first and then roll on that. And um, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Well, they're very they're so sharp. Yeah. Um, the the tower I think is great. For much like a, uh, a little like a rollerball, you know, instead of a mouse, it's an economy of space. It, it's very disciplined; that it doesn't <laughs> go outside of its zone, but it steals some of the experience, right? Yeah. Because um, at that point, you could just use a, an app or something if you, if you don't want to roll things. Yeah, and, and, I, and I get that people love them, and and, and I that, and I see that. I, I and I've I, like Eric said, I'm not very fond of them. I'm 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 not either, but I've seen. Very nice ones where you can like pull a little slide mm -hmm. and drop the die and it goes out to the players or into the DM. Yep. And it's part of the screen. And some of them just look really cool, like little yeah. like, keeps and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I think almost everyone I've seen yeah. is like a little tower uh, crenellated yep. top. Um, and then I think one of the other things that we had, I had, I had a list too. Oh, right. Uh, where like your first or your most memorable Your set first of dice. Those. Yeah. I'll go first because I'm talking. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> My first dice, I don't actually remember. The first one that I do remember, we'll call it my mm -hmm. first set. I still have most of, I don't have the D20. We lived in Tucson, Arizona at the time. 
I was in San Francisco for the summer because my dad's uh, home office for his company was there. So we were hanging out in San Francisco. I was bored. We were living in a little apartment <clears throat> uh, on the uh, on the wharf side, and uh, and I went down and I found I don't I don't remember the name of the game shop, but it was a great game shop, and I got my first copy of Dragon Magazine. Um, because I was just like, this has the most amazing art on the outside. Mm -hmm. I need this. And I got a, one of those tubes yep. of dice. So it was just like this stacked up but with a little cap on the top. I remember as a kid later in life, just sitting and rolling the dice. Just, just that. Uh, I didn't have a gaming group at the time. I didn't have games I was playing. I read through that Dragon Magazine, didn't understand like 90% of it. But it was so cool to have mm -hmm. the dice and have some connection to that uh, that gaming world. I don't know. It's, a, it's an odd story because I was yeah, like yeah. trying to peek into a world that I wasn't a part of uh, when I was probably 10, 12, somewhere in that age range. That was about the same age as well. And my introduction was I was, I think I, I, I touched on it last uh, episode of, of my first experience seeing you know, the different polyhedrals and then seeing like, okay, well... Your uncles, right? My uncles, they play it, but not knowing what they were until much, much later and not even the first time, not making the connection right away. But, uh, so my uncle Brian was in college at the time and I had played a couple sessions with some people at school. They, I mm -hmm. got into it, I, I picked up uh, a first edition PHP and my mom called up and said, you know that game you used to always play? Robert started playing it. <laughs> I just thought I'll let you know it. And, and Brian was like, game I used to play? Play that shit right now. You know? <laughs> he's like, I'll, you know, I'll drive down from Corvallis, he's going to OSU, and pick him up, bring him for the weekend, and we'll just play all weekend. And those are some like the, the, the very vivid memories of my childhood of being like, adults get to do whatever the fuck they want. You know, like, we're going to play D&D for a weekend. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> and he had this, like, studio because he's, you know, he's going to college and it was just, like, five people in there, you know, like, three college students and, you know, 12-year-old kid and we're just sitting there with our books and we're just playing D&D, like, sleeping as low as possible and trying to play as much as possible, right? <laughs> um, and I had, again, Dragon Magazine, um, I wonder if it was the same copy. I don't know, but... Uh, Did they have a molten dragon on the cover? I, 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 I've, I've seen that one. Okay. I don't remember which, which uh, issue it was, but they had all those ads in the back. Oh, yeah. Right? And I have this theory of uh, new gamers and experienced gamers, and you can tell them by their the dice that they use. If they're very, very colorful, they look fantastic, <laughs> they've got sparkles and you know, all that... But when you roll them, you just cannot read what the number is. It's a new gamer, right? If that that gamer, would be this set, which well, I, mean, I don't use. I can still use. read those. Yeah, I, but like if the the clearer the numbers are on the die, the more experienced that player is because they know that they want to roll it and they want to look good. But they it needs to be functional, right? So, um, so me as a brand new player, I saw these uh, chameleon dice in the back <laughs> of the uh, of Dragon Magazine. And they were uh, they were like game science dice, um, and that they weren't the numbers weren't colored in, right? Oh, they okay, yeah. in, and they were very sharp edges, uh, but they were you could tell they were made of like a sheet of plastic that had been folded over the. You know oh, what I mean? that sounds horrible. Because what they were is um, they would change color based on temperature. Oh. And so they were chameleon dice, and so the ones he got me were blue and black, oh, and so God. they. When they were cold, they were black. And when they were warm, they were blue. Now, um, they didn't roll the best. And I still have these today. Today, <laughs> I have this. It's my, you'll my you'll have to favorites. send me pictures of them. I'll bring them in sometime. Um, well, send, send pictures so I can put them on the video. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, so the way it's important, cold was freezing. Oh. And warm was anything close to room temperature. <laughs> <laughs> so I so vividly, blue dice. I vividly, yes, that's <laughs> exactly right. I vividly remember, um, and, and black was darker blue. <laughs> okay. Blue. So uh, I vividly remember the first session. I was so proud of these dice. My, what happened was uh, my birthday came around, and my uncle got me a set of these dice oh. for my birthday. I was over the moon. I got a bike for my birthday once, and I was less excited about the bike than I was about these dice. <laughs> So, but that weekend we had a gaming session, right? 
and I remember I can't remember his name, but my uncle had a friend who was very much so like you know kind of matter of fact and all that, and he was so pissed off at me because I would sit there and my turn would come and I would roll, and after I'd roll, I would run into the kitchen to put my d20 in the freezer <laughs> <laughs> so that it would, the next time it was my turn, it would be like black again, right? But I would go back and forth like all night. I'm just running back to the freezer, <laughs> running back like three rooms to get in the living room to, you know, it's like, yeah, and roll it. And then, you know, what happened? Oh, I don't care. Roll it back in the <laughs> put it back in the freezer. Uh, and he was so pissed. <laughs> I can't game with him anymore. Like it was, he was, he was really, he was living with me. And I didn't care. I, was, I, was, I thought that was just the coolest thing, you know. Uh, but that's the story about my... Not my, not my first set, but the, my most memorable, you know, initial set uh, playing games, uh, playing D&D with my uncle. Um, and then, yeah, I saw those the day. I'll, I'll take some pictures and send them to you. I should say, I believe uh, that day that I got my, the first ones I can remember, um, there was another memorable thing. I think I bought actually two sets, because I have white and black with alternate, with with the opposite color as the, as the numbers. And then I got a 36-sided die. Because I thought, that's going to be, I mean, you got you got all these. All why, the uses. Why not another weird number die? These are all weird number dies. Mm -hmm. uh, I still have it. It is the most, it's, it looks like a D10, but yep. it just has uh, whatever, 36 divided by two sides on each How cone. Long does that... Thing take stop rolling. Oh, it's it's for it, the, the horrible <laughs> thing is it's it's you roll it and it sticks to one side. Yes, yeah. It it won't like tilt back and forth between the two to the two cones. It's just like funk roll, mm. and then it keeps rolling and rolling in a little circle and it's done. Anyway, memorable but useless. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know. I think that's that's a good place to end. Yep. Um, thank you, Eric. Thank you. We'll see everybody next time. If uh, recommend that people subscribe if you enjoy this. Um, we'll probably keep doing this because we apparently enjoy doing it. Oh, uh, in the comments, if you have a suggestion for a name for the podcast, feel free to put it in there. Uh, we're not going to stick to anything for a little while, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's probably it. D20 Dreams is not a legit 900 line. You're not supporting us if you call it. Um, don't call it. We don't yeah. know what it goes to. <laughs> um, but thank you for watching. <laughs>